Hello everybody, welcome back to the Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series here exclusively on YouTube. Of course, I'm critically acclaimed author Cousin Vinny Agnello and uh, this is my nationally critically acclaimed book, The Devil's Glove, a Christian classic, a favorite, and one that I hope you're going to be very interested in after we read 180 pages. Well, not tonight, mind you. We're going to be doing this in 15-minute segments, and it just dawned on me, now that we're on page 92, that uh, it would be probably nice in case somebody around here might want to buy the book and might want to contact me to find out how they could get their autograph discount book. And uh, right there, <laughs> it's right in the picture, Cousin Vinny Agnello, 813-703-3618, and... Cousin Vinny 10 at gmail.com. My email address, it's going to be there for you. Anyway, we left you off on page 92 yesterday with Eddie and his dad at dinner. And Eddie introducing his dream coach to his father. Here we go. Didn't I tell you, Lucy, that I thought that Mr. Mitchell was a hell of a good coach? You sure did, dear. Dad, I'm not talking about Mr. Mitchell. I'm talking about my dream coach. He's really nice, and he's given me all kinds of good tips to improve my game. Eddie, you're something else. You know that? You literally eat, sleep, and dream baseball, don't you? Mr. Romano inquired in an amused tone of voice. I do, Dad. The way things are going, I'm going to be a major leaguer too. <clears throat> you sure will. And if for any reason that doesn't work out for you, then maybe you should really think about becoming a writer, since you've really got a great imagination, kiddo. Maybe you just spelled it out, Vince. Maybe the problem is his imagination. Maybe we have a future artist in our household, Lucy hoped, trying her best to put a bright spin on their current dilemma. The chimes of the doorbell interrupted the conversation, and Mrs. Romano got up from the table and headed toward the front door. She opened it and found Billy Ray standing on her doorstep. Hi, Mrs. Romano. Is Eddie home? Billy Ray inquired in good spirits. He sure is, Billy Ray. We're just finishing dinner. You want to come in? Sure. <clears throat> you guys ate late tonight, huh? We did indeed. Billy Ray followed Mrs. Romano into the kitchen. Can I get, some, get you something to drink? No thanks, Mrs. Romano. Hi, Eddie. Why'd you race off so fast after practice? I got better things to do with my time than hang out with you fellas, Eddie snapped. Eddie, that's rude. Apologize to Billy Ray, Mr. Romano demanded. Sorry, Billy Ray, Eddie said flippantly. Eddie, what's wrong with you? I'm your friend. Why are you treating me like this? He doesn't mean it, Billy Ray. Something's obviously troubling him. That's just your opinion, Mom, Eddie interjected as he continued to eat his meal, showing little interest in the conversation taking place around him. So how's the team look, Billy Ray? Mr. Romano asked, trying to move on to a new subject. I guess we're getting better. The coach was certainly impressed with Eddie's play today. He's really improved a lot. Stevie said to me after practice that Eddie looked and acted like a completely different hitter. Everybody was happen happy for you, Eddie. We were all coming up to congratulate you, and you just took off. Not interested in the team's good tidings, Billy Ray. They're all a bunch of two-faced hypocrites. They don't like me, and I don't like them. They don't wish me well, and I certainly don't wish them well. That's not true. That might apply to Johnny, but it doesn't apply to the rest of us. I mean, until you acted so stuck up today, you were awfully popular. I just don't understand you. Billy Ray, I don't care what you understand and what you don't understand. So do yourself a favor and mind your own business. I thought we were friends. 
I guess we're not anymore, huh? Guess not. I don't need friends, Eddie said flippantly. Billy Ray turned and raced out of the kitchen. Mr. Romano followed his exit. He caught up to Billy Ray by the front door. I'm sorry, Billy Ray. I don't know what in hell is wrong with him. He hasn't been himself for a couple days now. I'm sure he'll snap out of it, Mr. Romano stated with concern in his voice. I hope so. He's just totally different. He's like night and day. He's going to lose all his friends if he keeps up this attitude. Some people aren't quite as tolerant as I am. I'm used to moody people. You should see how my mother acts when she gets her rag. Billy Ray, you shouldn't be talking like that. Where do you boys get your education these days? I got mine from my older brothers, but some guys learn a lot just by reading the bathroom walls. Billy Ray said with a grin. Get out of here, Mr. Romano said playfully. I'm going to have a long talk with him, so don't you worry. Billy Ray exited the house with his head hung quite a bit lower than it was when he first arrived. Next chapter. The big game or Eddie's legend begins. <clears throat> Eddie couldn't wait for Saturday. His team was playing against the Southside Tigers, and he had practiced so well during the week that Mr. Mitchell inserted him into the starting lineup. This marked the first time that he'd ever started for the Astros. He was assigned shortstop duties, and his hitting improved so much that Mr. Mitchell penciled him in for the fifth spot in the batting order. Eddie was extremely overbearing all week long as he bragged about his newly acquired baseball prowess to his family and anyone else who would listen. He informed everyone that Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were both going to be giving him batting tips between each of his turns at bat. His seemingly unbelievable remarks became a major target of criticism by his teammates. He was the butt of many of their jokes in the dugout, but their criticism seemed to have no effect upon him, and he was oblivious to all outside influences except those that he perceived would affect the magic of his glove. The Romano family arrived early at the Little League ballpark. Mrs. Romano parked her Jeep and began freshening her makeup uh, in the truck mirror as Eddie and Mr. Romano exited. She wanted to look her best for the community social event disguised as a Little League baseball game. Since her son did his best imitation of Muhammad Ali all week long, trumpeting that he was going to be the star of the game, she hoped for his sake that his predictions would come true. As she looked out toward the field at her husband and son playing catch, she recalled how she told Eddie that people would like him better if he didn't brag so much. She told him that he would be better served by letting others compliment him instead. But she realized that her words were wasted on deaf ears when he told her, Mom, it ain't bragging if you can do it. There was a general feeling of alarm contained within her all through the week. She couldn't put her finger on it, but she knew that something unusual was occurring to her son. What happened to the loving, considerate, and humble boy that she had raised? This was the question that ate at her during her, all her waking hours. She feared that he was having some kind of psychological breakdown. That would explain his make-believe phone conversations with his baseball heroes. As she climbed down from the Jeep, an overwhelming sense of dread came over her. It was like she was attending her son's public execution. Mrs. Jones, a board member of the PTA at the middle school, noticed her immediately and came rushing over to give her an insecure, insincere greeting. Mrs. Jones wore a dress with flower prints and a large red flowery sun hat. Well, look who it is. It's the star of the game's mother, she said facetiously as she snickered. I'm sorry, Lucy. I had to throw that in, 
Brett's been telling me all week long how your son is laid claim to being the star of this game. I myself thought it was kind of amusing that an 11 year old who last week was afraid to step up to the plate with the game on the line could suddenly lay claim to such a notion. But anyway, you must have really overdone the confidence training in your family this week, she added condescendingly. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that you find Eddie so amusing, Lori, but maybe it would be better for you to focus your attention upon your own boys. Why don't you tend to him and let me take care of mine, Mrs. Romano fumed. Mrs. Jones raced off in a huff, going out of her way to make a scene, shouting, Some people just can't take a joke. Looking for her husband, Mrs. Romano approached the bleachers. She spotted him, spotted him in the first row of seats, munching on a hot dog and washing it down with a can of soda. As she approached him, she could clearly hear the muffled whispers of some of the other parents in attendance. Pretending to not to notice, she sat down next to him. Vince, we got a problem. And he's been bragging to everyone. Mr. Romano, a very proud father, gave his wife a dumb look in reply to her remark. The boy's 11 years old. Are you forgetting that fact? Who's really going to hold him accountable for the things he says? They are, Vince, Mrs. Romano stated, gesturing to the other parents in attendance. Screw them! Who cares what they think? Who are they anyway? Vince, we have to live in this community. Look, Lucy, if they're going to make a big stink about the talk of an 11-year-old boy, then they got some serious problems. If that's the case, maybe they belong back in middle school. Now just drop it. I came here to enjoy my son's game. I think it's great that he's finally developing some self-confidence. I'm happy that he's getting some confidence too, but I don't want him to become the town braggart. Let's see how well the boy does before passing judgment. Believe me, nothing will shut these people up faster than success. If Eddie plays half as well as he says he's going to, you won't hear a single peep out of any of them. That I guarantee. So you think it's okay that we're raising the next Muhammad Ali? Lucy, he's 11 years old. He's obviously going through a phase. I think you're jumping the gun just a bit, Mr. Romano grinned. A great big round of applause interrupted their conversation as the Tigers took the field. The Tigers were in first place in, li in the Little League standings, while Eddie's team, the Astros, was in dead last. Many of the parents of the Tigers players began shouting encouragement to them. Seated directly behind the Romanos was a short, heavy-set, thuggish-looking man of Italian descent with oily skin. He was dressed in a leisure suit and wore dark sunglasses. Besides his obnoxious mouth, his most salient idiosyncrasy, according to the Romanos, was his habit of constantly taking his handkerchief out of his pocket to wipe the sweat from his forehead. It seemed like he was performing that action every other minute. Come on, Rocco! Strike these bums out, screamed the man who turned out to be the father of the Tigers pitcher. He was loud crude and lewd. He made sure his presence was known by all around him. Mr. Romano glanced back and gave the man a dirty look. The pitcher's father immediately took notice and smiled arrogantly as he realized that he had accomplished his mission of annoying someone. It was as if being the center of attention was his main objective in life. The man relished the fact that he had grabbed the spotlight and someone was paying attention to him. He declared, That's my boy out there. Best pitcher in the league. You're going to die when you see this kid's fastball. You watch these Astros when they, go, when they go up to bat. They'll be shaking in their boots. Don't worry. It won't be too unpleasant for them. They'll get used to it after a while. They all do. 
They'll just swing three times and go and sit their asses right back down where they belong, right on that bench collecting splinters. Sometimes you're just outclassed. You know what I mean? Boy, you can say that again, Mr. Romano chuckled, thinking that this obnoxious man had just made a Freudian slip. He added, Mr. You see, that's why they play the game. You're guaranteed nothing. My son plays for the Astros, and I want to make you a promise right here and now. You see, he's such a good hitter that he's going to blast one of your son's pitches right out of this ballpark. What do you think of that, Mr.